Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? So thank you, Carrie, for, uh, and George for organizing this uh, wonderful day. I'm humbled to be part of this uh, extraordinary lineup. And I uh, also thank uh, the Gardner Foundation for sponsoring this uh, very special day. So I'm also uh, pleased to see and, and uh, intimidated a little bit to have the, some of the the higher players of Theta Rhythm Generation here in the room with uh, Yuri Buzaki and, of course, Stan Loom, who's here today, which uh, I enjoy uh, sharing uh, all sorts of ideas. So it's great, to, uh, it's great to be here. So I'll give you today my little insight and some recent results on the septohippocampal system. And the uh, septohippocampal system has been tied to uh, Theta Generation for a very, very long time. And, uh, some uh, idea about the basic idea here. So data uh, generation, uh, uh, Pascal Fries has, has talked about it a little bit, and I'm sure uh, Yuri will talk about it uh, after me, is uh, this extraordinary rhythm that's recorded extracellularly in the hippocampus when the animal is moving around and exploring the environment. So this rhythm of 4 to 12 hertz is recorded in nearly all regions of the hippocampus, including CA1, CA3, subiculum, and dentate gyrus. And uh, these are very interesting types of rhythms. And what is also interesting for us and for the talk here uh, this afternoon is that this theta uh, rhythm is also very prominent during sleep, and especially during uh, REM sleep, rapid eye uh, movement sleep, or paradoxical sleep, as we say in French. So theta is also predominant in sleep in that state, in REM sleep. So this is the plan of a little bit of what I'm going to talk about. And I do apologize maybe for some of you folks who were there in uh, at U of T about three weeks ago. So some of these results might be uh, very similar to what you've seen before. But maybe I'll talk maybe uh, faster so it's going to seem a little different, OK? So, so that's the plan here. So I'll tell you a little bit about the medial septum and the hippocampus and how theta is generated and hopefully tell you a little bit about how theta is important for memory. I'll tell you about the connections between the medial septum, which is this structure here, which is located uh, rostrally in the brain that's interconnected with these two hippocampi. And they're heavily, uh, this region is, uh, heavily innervates the hippocampus, and it also gets some projections back to the medial septum. So I'll tell you a little bit about the finer wiring of, of uh, these two regions. I'll show you some recent results about uh, one of the population of the cells in the medial septum, the GABAergic cells, and how they play a role in theta generation and in memory. And I'll skip over the cholinergic cells just because of time, but I'll be happy to uh, talk about it if you're interested. And lastly, I'll talk about the glutamate cells, which are also located in the medial septum. And I'll tell you about some recent findings in our lab that makes these cells especially interesting for us. And uh, finally, concerning the glutamate cells in the medial septum, uh, I'm going to show you data using a combination of uh, calcium imaging in freely behaving mice, as well as optogenetics to determine their role in spatial memory. OK. So theta rhythm, as I uh, indicated a little earlier, is predominant during wakefulness. It's also predominant during REM sleep. And as you can see here, these two states, the, the theta actually, just in terms of, of, uh, of how it looks, it, it actually looks very, very similar. It also has some uh, gamma riding on the theta waves, and it's very similar. Uh, in both regions. We don't know exactly if these, the data generated in these two regions are exactly the same in terms of mechanism, but certainly they look very similar. The other state that's very prominent during sleep is non-REM sleep or slow wave sleep, and this is actually where the, slow, uh, the sharp waves uh, occur, and that I'll show you should be important for memory consolidation. All right. So theta, I won't go into all the details about theta and how it's linked to memory, but I think it's sufficient to say that 
Uh, a lot of ideas is that it actually uh, binds place cells together. Place cells are very important for the cognitive mapping of the environment and helps form sequences uh, into uh, memory. It also uh, regulates synaptic plasticity. Graham Colligridge this morning has talked a little bit about this, so how theta is involved in synaptic plasticity. So very important uh, uh, rhythm uh, in the hippocampus that's associated with synaptic plasticity and memory. So one important uh, finding uh, to me was in the late 1970s by Jonathan Winston. And what he showed actually if that is that if you lesion the medial septum uh, with, I guess, that was hypotenic acid, if you lesion the medial septum, the first thing that is really evident is that the theta, this is the theta before and after the lesion, is, is more or less gone, as well as, as the theta during REM sleep, but the slow wave is not impaired. So, but that was uh, shown before him. But what he showed also was that spatial memory was impaired uh, when you lesion the medial septum. So, when I started my lab, I really wanted to uh, start to characterize the different cells in the, uh, in the medial septum. At that time, we were using slices and patch recording and single cell uh, RT-PCR also, multiplex single cell RT-PCR. And conventionally, uh, before I started, this was the model of the cells that connected from the medial septum to the hippocampus. There were two principal cell types, the GABAergic cells and the cholinergic cells. And then we, when we started recording from these slices, we found these, uh, these cells. So they're actually the most abundant cells in the medial septum. They are GAD67 positive, so they are, uh, they are uh, GABAergic and they are fast-firing cells. And the other one are these cholinergic cells, so positive for CHAP and they are usually slow-firing cells. But interestingly, and in, in earlier on, what we found was that there was a, a large portion of cells, maybe a quarter of the cells in the medial septum, were actually positive for VGLUT2, which is the vesicular glutamate transporter 2. So that is only found in cells that uses and secretes glutamate as a neurotransmitter. And these cells were, here I'm only showing one type, but it actually uh, there's a heterogeneity in the cells and how they fire in the slice. Anyway, what was important here is that there was a, a quarter of the population of the cells in the medial septum that were glutamate positive, and it's always been an interest in my lab to understand what these cells do in terms of memory. And I'll show you at the end of the talk how these cells could be involved in spatial memory. So this is more or less throughout uh, several publications in my lab and, and from other labs, uh, showing the connectivity between the cells in the medial septum and hippocampus. So basically, you have the cholinergic cells that impinge on both the prandial cells and also interneurons, whereas the glutamate cells um, innervate some interneurons and some prandial cells. And the GABAergic cells are actually very interesting. I was shown years ago by Thomas Strong was that these cells only target GABAergic interneurons in hippocampus. So one of the first questions that we wanted to uh, answer was what's the role of, of these cells in theta generation? And using optogenetics, we wanted to uh, answer the question if, first of all, these GABAergic cells were very important for generating the rhythm uh, in hippocampus. So, and uh, finally, as I was saying, how these different cells play differential roles in spatial memory. So we use optogenetics to target these different cell populations independently. So we use different mice lines. So the vigla 2 cree mice line to target only glutamate cells the VGAT and the PV-CREAM mice line to target only GABAergic cells, 
and the CHAT reminds me to target cholinergic cells. In the lab or in these uh, uh, data that I'm going to show you, we use basically two flavors of these opsins. So we use a variant of CHR2 called CHETA, and as the name indicates, CHETA is an is a, um, is a excitatory opsin that is very fast, so you can really control the speed at which you want to control cell firing. And to inhibit the cells, we use ArchT, which is a proton pump. So it actually extrudes proton out of the cells to inhibit uh, the neurons when you flash a yellow or green light. OK. So this is the way we do the experiment. Uh, we uh, inject, uh, through a virus, the uh, gene for cheetah or ArchT. We wait for three weeks. We implant the optic fibers in the medial septum, and we have different recording uh, electrodes in the uh, hippocampus here. We're just uh, recording CA1 of the hippocampus, and we activate or inhibit these different toxins with a blue light or green light. This is one example of a transfection in the medial septum. So you see here, this is the medial septum in a transverse slice. And you can see that uh, the, the virus, which also has a, a GFP reporter, is located only in the medial septum, so a, a very nice transfection only in the medial septum. And this is where we, we have the uh, optic fiber. And you can see here also the relatively extensive arborization of these GABAergic cells all over the hippocampus, OK? So these cells uh, intensely innervate the hippocampus. So uh, one of the uh, first experiments was to activate those garbage cells with the question, can we actually uh, generate data? Okay. So uh, in this example, we stimulated at 10 hertz. And you can see here a nice peak at 10 hertz. And this is a spectrogram here showing the data when actually this is wake, but you get the uh, exact same uh, data during REM sleep. So you have the uh, basal theta uh, rhythm at around uh, 7 hertz. When you stimulate at 10 hertz, you can see a nice uh, increase in power of the theta right here. And actually, you can drive theta when using different frequencies from 3 to uh, 12 hertz. You can even go higher, 20, 40 hertz. And you can actually control hippocampal rhythm uh, using these different types of stimulation frequencies by manipulating those GABAergic cells in the medial septum. So if we do the opposite now, the question is, are these cells, and there's been a lot of data out there showing or proposing that these GABAergic cells could be key in generating theta. So we did those inhibitory experiments. Now we have ArchT in those GABAergic cells using a 594 nanometer light. Here's the spectrogram here. This is the frequency. This is around 8 hertz. This is time. EMG is the muscle tone. So this experiment actually is done during REM sleep. But you get the exact same result during wake. When you, uh, you have the theta here at baseline, you inhibit those GABAergic cells, and you see that uh, a lot of the power of theta is significantly reduced. You turn off the laser, and the theta comes back. Okay, so that really suggests uh, this is the uh, overall um, uh, data. So the power spectrum for different experiments showing that during inhibition of these GABAergic cells, uh, as a mean, uh, you see a very large reduction in the theta around 65 to 80% of the power is gone when you shut down those GABAergic cells, OK? So, so that's great. It really shows you that these cells are extremely important for theta generation. So that was the first thing that was really interesting for us. The other thing that's really interesting is that if you look at the different frequencies in hippocampus, you can see that the uh, inhibition of these GABAergic cells seems to only reduce theta power, OK? So this is the raw data at baseline. Again, this is all done during REM sleep. So you see the theta at baseline. When you inhibit those cells, you see a, a large reduction in the amplitude. This is the, the uh, filtered theta. But there's no effect on the delta, the alpha, beta, low gamma, high gamma. Or does it affect the number of ripples occurring during sleep? 
or has any effect on the muscle tone. So surprisingly, if you inhibit those cells, you only have a reduction in theta power. Now, if you do a similar experiment by using a linear probe in hippocampus, you can see here the theta in different, the different layers, and you can see that the theta power is uh, larger uh, in, the, in the deeper layer of the hippocampus, which has been shown many, many times before. And during uh, the, the inhibition of those GABAergic cells in the medial septum, you see a, a significant increase in the power of theta. So this is the uh, power spectrum in the different layers before and during inhibition. You see that the power of theta is reduced in the different layers of the hippocampus from orient to lacunosum moleculari. So that means that when you shut down those GABAergic cells, you have a general reduction of theta rhythm throughout the different layers of the hippocampus. So that's great. These cells are very important. But what we wanted to do now is see if REM sleep has a role in memory consolidation, OK? So we have this wonderful tool now. Can we manipulate data during uh, REM sleep and see if this is really important for memory consolidation? So one uh, dominant theory, and there's actually a lot of results uh, uh, suggesting that, that this, this, uh, this uh, hypothesis is true, is that uh, you have, when you're recording place cells in hippocampus going through different fields, and you're recording different uh, place cells, you can see if you're recording uh, at the same time the theta rhythm, you can see uh, sequences of place cells that are reactivated during the theta cycles. And the idea is that in this initial step of theta, maybe there's already some sort of binding of the place cells together. But interestingly, when the animal either stops or goes into slow wave sleep, you can record sharp wave ripple and you can see replay of these cells. Uh, these are experiments that we haven't done in our lab, but that have been done in many other labs, including uh, Yuri Buzaki's lab. So you can see sequences of these place cells that are replayed during a slow wave sleep, and that's thought to be extremely important for memory consolidation. But our idea was, OK, so what about REM sleep, which is pretty interesting, because REM sleep was probably one of the first regions that was suggested to be key in, um, in memory consolidation. But right after that, uh, there were a lot of data showing that slow wave sleep and sharp wave were critical for memory consolidation. So the idea of REM sleep was important for memory consolidation, was sort of pushed to the side in the last uh, the last few decades, last couple of decades, actually. So what we wanted to do is, in this case, do uh, perform a couple of different tasks, spatial memory tasks that are hippocampal dependent. First of all, uh, using a novel object task, which most of you know uh, that task. We know it's hippocampal dependent. And uh, another task that actually I won't show you the results, but it's basically the same results, are using contextual uh, fear conditioning. And uh, so we, we, we used these two tasks. And the way we did the experiment is the following. So for the novel object, usually we had the uh, mice uh, run around the environment for about 10 minutes just to familiarize itself with the test area. Then on the uh, next day, the, uh, the mice would be subjected to uh, these two objects. So the, of course, the mice would explore the two objects, and we would measure the amount of time the mice would uh, explore the two objects. And then we take the animals, put them back in their own cage, and in the first four hours, when they're in their own cage, and because their own cage is really boring, the mice would fall asleep. And in those four hours, we would only inhibit the GABAergic cells of the medial septum and significantly reduce the theta to perturb the theta during REM sleep and see if that would actually block memory consolidation. And on the next day, uh, so the animals would spend four hours where we're inhibiting the, the, uh, the REM sleep. And then after that, we let the animal rest. And on the next day, we put the animals back in the same uh, 
in the same area, in the same test, but this time we would move one of the two objects. And then, of course, measure how much time the animals would spend exploring the two objects, with the idea, of course, that if we block memory consolidation, the animals would explore the two objects equally, not remembering that one of the objects is in a new context and has been moved. Okay, so this is how we did the experiment. So this is the, uh, the hypnogram, okay? This is the test session, and what you see here is the wake state, and these little uh, hairy things here are the slow wave, and here these very short bouts are the REM sleep. And the first thing that, that you can see here is that the REM sleep is actually very short lasting. It only lasts uh, 20, 30, sometimes up to a minute, but these are usually very, very uh, short in duration, and then it comes back to slow waves, and sometimes the animal would wake up, okay? So the idea is every time we see REM sleep, we turn on the lasers, reduce the theta, and as soon as the uh, muscle tone would go back and we'd see some slow wave, we'd actually turn off the laser. And these experiments were done with uh, Richard Boyce and uh, actually uh, using a lot of caffeine because these are very intensive experiments. And uh, so these were done in the first four hours. And these are uh, the three groups we tested, okay? So of course, the experimental group, so only the virus with the YFT reporter without the opsin, so this is our, really our, our control group. Our RHT group, so this is the group where we uh, injected the opsin, the RHT to inhibit the GABAergic cells, and the third group is just injecting the, the opsin, but we will not apply any light. So it's just to see if the opsin has some toxic effect on the cells in the medial septum. So these are the, the responses that we have measured. So in control, of course, when we turn on the laser, nothing happens to the theta if there's no opsin in those cells. It inhibits uh, the theta if, uh, you know, if we turn on the yellow light on these uh, cells expressing the, the RHT. And here, we're not turning on the laser, so we have normal theta. Okay, so this is during the first day. The animal is exploring the two objects, and in those three groups I've just talked about, we're measuring the exploration time uh, of these two objects. And as you can see here in those three groups, the control group, the RHT group, and the RHT where we're not turning on the light, you can see that uh, both objects are being explored equally by the mice, okay? Then we, of course, put the animals back in their own cage. We turn on the lasers during REM. And this, on the next day, we bring the animals back with the two objects being displaced. And we see, as we uh, expected, that the control group, the mice, will spend more time exploring the object that's moved. And this is very similar to uh, the group that the RHT has in, uh, or the RHT inhibited the, has not inhibited, sorry, the GABAergic cell. So these two groups are the same, they're control groups. But for, for the animals where the theta was reduced significantly, you can see that both objects were explored equally, suggesting that memory consolidation was blocked. So we did loads of controls. We measured uh, a sleep structure, and that wasn't changed. We measured the number of sharp waves after we uh, inhibited the, uh, the, the uh, theta during REM, and there were no changes. And it seems that just uh, reducing theta during REM is responsible for blocking memory consolidation. We did very similar experiments using contextual fear conditioning, as I said before, and we saw the exact same results, but we didn't alter acute fear conditioning, okay, which is usually amygdala dependent. Okay. So, in conclusion, then, these uh, uh, GABAergic cells uh, are extremely important for theta generation, and these neurons are uh, very important for generating theta during REM, and REM is, seems to be uh, important for memory consolidation. And this is really the first causal results linking uh, uh, REM sleep and memory consolidation. 
Okay, so what about those uh, glutamate cells? So these glutamate cells, as I said, were first recorded by Florence Sotti, who was my first postdoc in my lab. And uh, she showed that these cells were glutamate. And these cells are pretty interesting. They, as I said, innervate the different cell types in the hippocampus. But they also seem to play a very important role in modulating the cells at the uh, local circuit level in the medial septum. So we started those experiments manipulating optogenetically those glutamate cells when actually a paper came out. And this was from a group in Germany. They actually started also playing with those glutamate cells, uh, my cells, actually. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, they never asked me <laughs> to play with those cells. But nevertheless, they actually had some very interesting results. And the results were done in the following manner. So they had a mice that was head fixed sitting on a ball and basically running in a uh, virtual environment, OK? And what they did was optogenetically stimulate those cells. So this is, again, the spectrogram. This is the uh, theta. And when you stimulate here at 9 hertz, they showed that you can actually increase the frequency of theta in the hippocampus by increasing the uh, frequency of those uh, glutamate cells. So that was pretty interesting, showing that you, know, you can control somewhat data generation by activating those glutamate cells from the medial septum. What was also interesting is that they uh, suggested that uh, when you increase the frequency of stimulation of these glutamate cells, the mice uh, started running, OK? And started running at a frequency uh, that was uh, a speed that was dependent on the frequency of stimulation. And you can see here. So first, locomotion reliability. The higher the frequency you stimulate those cells, you know, the more reliable you can actually activate those mice to run on the ball. Okay? And there's a certain relationship between the velocity at which the mice are running and the frequency you're stimulating those glutamate cells. So that's very interesting. And, uh, that's very interesting, but they were looking at one parameter, and this is uh, speed of running, right? If you're a mice on a ball, and the only thing you're measuring is speed of running, there are chances you'll see changes in speed of running, OK? So uh, we wanted to uh, have a different perspective on the role of these cells. So Again, we transfected these Vigla 2 uh, mice. And this is one example here of the cheetah expression with the YFP flag of in those glutamate cells in the medial septum. You can appreciate that there are uh, much less of these cells in the medial septum than, than the GABAergic cells I just showed you previously. But nevertheless, uh, in freely behaving mice, in freely behaving mice, uh, we showed that, yes, if you increase the frequency that you stimulate those cells, those glutamate cells, you can actually more or less control the frequency of hippocampal theta in CA3 and CA1. These are the two regions we've measured. And this is a very a linear, a nice and linear increase in the frequency of theta. So yes, activating those cells seem to be associated with an increase in uh, theta frequency. Now, if you do the converse experiment, though, that wasn't done before, you actually don't see much, which also is quite interesting in a sense. So this is the uh, theta during REM sleep. So we shut down those cells with ArchT. And you can see that uh, if you shut down those cells during wake or during REM sleep, nothing much happened to the basal frequency of theta. So there might be a small reduction, but it's not significant. And nothing happens to the power of theta if you inhibit those cells. So yes, you can more or less modulate theta. But if you take those cells out, nothing happens to the theta. Okay. So we wanted to use a, a different approach and really wanted to see if those cells were important for spatial memory. So that's why we started using calcium imaging in freely behaving mice. And we coupled the uh, calcium imaging with optogenetic inhibition of those cells. 
So in my lab, we were very uh, lucky to be uh, beta testers for a camera developed by Doric Lens, which is more or less the same that was developed by Mark Schnitzer and in Inscopic a few years back. And uh, so we started using those cameras about three years ago. And then now we're using the UCLA Miniscope, which was uh, uh, developed uh, uh, through a brain initiative grant by uh, Payman uh, Golshani and Alcino Silva. And I, I have to tell you that these UCLA uh, miniscopes are amazing. And I think that uh, they're very cheap and that uh, I urge you to try them. So it costs less than $1,000 to use these cameras and they're very interesting to use. So we started using these cameras and first of all, this is how we're using uh, the calcium imaging, so we transfect uh, GCAMP6 fast uh, in uh, Vigla2 Cree uh, mice to express the uh, calcium reporter GCAMP6 only in glutamate neurons. And then after that, we wait for three weeks, then we implant the green lens. These are the glass rods that are implanted. So you know the septum is a very deep area, so we use very long eight millimeter green lens right in the medial septum, and these green lens have a diameter of around 500 micrometers, so they're very thin uh, in comparison to most of the greens that are used for hippocampus, which are usually around 1.8 millimeter. So we wait for a little while, we implant the greens, and then uh, about uh, 28 days later, three, four weeks later, we uh, put on the uh, miniscope or the direct lens uh, miniscope, and we start imaging the cells, okay? So these are uh, an example of the raw data, and you can see some of the cells in the medial septum here. If you do the delta F over F, you can see the cells in the medial septum. They're very spread out. These, I mean, the, the uh, concentration of these cells is pretty low. Then we use PCA, ICA analysis. We extract the ROI, and then uh, we can see the calcium signal indicating the activity of those glutamate cells. Usually, here is an example where we had about uh, 15 cells uh, in focus, and sometimes you have two, sometimes you have 20, and just depending on the gods of calcium imaging, basically. So these are the types of signals that we see. Uh, so this is an example here of those uh, glutamate cells uh, being activated in the um, medial septum. So these are glutamate cells when the animal is moving around the environment. Okay, there are very few of them, but you can distinctly see when the cells fire. We did many other uh, brain regions, such as hippocampus, and you can see in hippocampus uh, that you can actually see uh, many, many different cells, up to five or 600 Prandtl cells at the same time when the animal is freely behaving. So, so these uh, these uh, calcium imaging techniques are really cool, and I'll tell you more about what we find with uh, those cameras. So, what we wanted to do is try to see what those cells, how those glutamate cells in the medial septum behave when the animal is doing a learning task. So, we chose a five-arm. Uh, uh, spatial maze here. So the mice is put into the start arm for 30 seconds, then we remove the door, and then we let the animal explore, and there's a water reward at the end. These uh, animals are slightly uh, water deprived, so they're really looking forward to get the water, okay? So the way we do the experiments is the following, okay? So initially, we let the animal explore. There's no water at the end, and we let the animals explore in the environment for four minutes, just looking around, checking the different arms. And then we measure, you know, how much time they're spending in each arm. And as expected, you know, uh, there's no arm that is preferred by the, by the mice, and usually they'll spend equal amount of time in the five arms, okay? Now we start doing the experiments, and this time what we do, we put the water reward, and we do four trials per day for three days, and we start the, uh, 
we put the, uh, the mice in the different arms at random and let the animal that explores, and usually they'll use the cues on the walls to find the water reward, okay? We do that for three days and with four trials, and on the fourth day, we uh, do the probe test where we remove the water and just quantify how much time the animal spends in each arm. Of course, if the animal remembers where the reward uh, was, he'll spend most of his time in the reward baited arm that was baited. So these are the results showing that, well, of course, the animals learn, and at the end of four days, they spend a long time in the reward arm, okay? So that's, of course, not unexpected. They learn to, uh, to uh, navigate to the baited arm, okay? And you can quantify this, and you can see that most of the time is spent on the probe day, most of the time is spent in the rewarded arm, in the target arm, okay? Whereas it doesn't spend much time in the other arms. Okay, good, so now the animals know where the baited arm, they learn where it is. So can we have a spatial uh, correlation of the cells of the of these uh, glutamate cells with the behavior, okay? So this is one example here where we have uh, just two neurons. I'm showing just two neurons, two glutamate cells. Here's the maze, here's the, the door, and this is the baited arm here. And you'll see that, um, okay, so here we have the animal taking off the door, then we see the activity of the glutamate cells, then it shuts down, then it's going to uh, the wrong arm, the unbaited arm, and then you'll see that, oh, okay, I'm turning back, and then I'm getting the reward here, and then the cells light up again, okay? So what happened here, I can actually do it again, and, and we've recorded what the mice says, and it says, okay, great, the door is out, I'm thirsty, so the cells are lighting up. I'm going to go, but hope what's in this arm here, that's really interesting, but really there's no water, so okay, what do I do? I'm going to go right, and okay, great, there's some water here, and it doesn't move, and you see the cells are activated again, okay? So, so that's pretty interesting that these cells, or a large proportion of these glutamate cells seem to be activated before there's any movement. So when we open the gate, it's where it seems that these cells are related to the planning of where the animal is going to go, okay? So what we wanted to look at is, um, uh, so the, the uh, postdoc that were doing these experiments was uh, Jean-Bastien Butt, and he was telling me, you know, I'm sure they're coding for something, I'm sure they're coding for something. And I told him, you know, I think, you know, you have to be a bit more precise here. Maybe stop focusing on the reward and, and look at where the animal is going in relation to where the cells were activated. And this is really uh, what happened. And what we started looking at is, okay, so you saw that these mice were actually going to one arm that had nothing to do with the reward and then going to the reward site. So just maybe the, the uh, cell population, those glutamate cells actually code for the destination that's not really related to the, to the reward arm, but just the location of the arm. And this is, what happened when we sorted out the cells that were going to, for example, only the arm that we call minus two versus the arm called minus one to the bait to plus one or plus two. And this is what happened when we started classifying the cells. So these are all the cells, the, the 144 cells that were recorded. And this is the, uh, in red here, is the movement. So. When the animals start moving in the box, uh, this is the red line here. So anything after the red line is, is related to movement, okay? So you can see the cell activity before movement and after movement when the animal is going for the arm minus two. And what we saw was that, yeah, there was a bunch of neurons here that were actually activated only when they're going to the arm minus two. A bunch of cells that were going to uh, minus one a bunch of cells that were going to the target, 
a bunch of cells that were activated only when they were going to the plus one arm and a bunch of cells going to the plus two arm. So it seems that these cells start being activated when they're going to a specific arm, okay? So they're planning a, a trajectory, I would say. Interestingly, now, when they are going to uh, the arm minus two, for example, and then they're going to the reward site, what is the type of activity that we see? So for the, for the, uh, for the cells here that were going to uh, minus two, the minus two arm, they're being reactivated at the reward site. So this is the final destination at the reward site. These cells are activated again. So they're being activated before they start moving and they're reactivated in the uh, baited arm, okay? The same thing for the, the cells that coded for uh, the minus one arm for the target, plus one or plus two. So there seems to be some sort of pre-coding of the destination uh, for the, that these cells are doing, and then they're reactivated when they reach the target arm, okay? Okay, so this is cool. So how is this related to memory? So what we did here, we did basically the same experiment, but what we did was to inhibit those cells only in the start arm, so trying to inhibit the cells that were activated, uh, that were pre-coding probably for the trajectory, selection, and we inhibited those cells when we raised the, uh, the, uh, the door, and when the animal started turning, either left or right, we stopped inhibiting those cells, okay? So basically, we, inhibiting, we inhibited the glutamate cells only at the beginning here, when we saw the activity of a good portion of those glutamate cells, and these uh, are the results that we saw, <coughs> okay? We did the same experiment, and when you inhibit those glutamate cells only in this start arm, okay, and just at the beginning when they start moving, you can see that in contrast to the control group that learns where the probe is very quickly, actually those mice uh, uh, have a reduced memory or a reduced, uh, a reduced uh, number of... Uh, of, uh, of targets, so they, they actually cannot find their targets as efficiently as the control group, okay? So, and this is just uh, another way of looking at uh, the time spent on the probe, and you can see that on the probe trial, all the animals that were inhibited at the beginning actually uh, were traveling around the different arms at equal uh, time, okay? Meaning that, or suggesting that these animals didn't remember really where it was going and what maybe it was planning. So, um, I will just maybe conclude here and just to say that the uh, using uh, calcium imaging we were able to find uh, trajectory destination coding and we didn't see really a, a quite an interesting relation with speed and locomotion that was reported uh, before. I have other results that I'm not showing, but it wasn't really related to locomotion, but I'd be happy to talk about it if you're interested. And if when you inhibit those glutamate cells, there's no change in locomotion or in speed, but we definitely see a deficit in navigation. So these cells play a very un unsuspected role in spatial trajectory coding. So in conclusion, all the different cells, it seems, in the medial septum play very different role in theta generation and memory. Certainly those GABAergic cells play a critical role in theta generation and memory consolidation during REM sleep, whereas those glutamate cells seem to play a role in uh, organizing where it's going to go in the environment and maybe in relation to planning. So I'll stop here, and I'd like to thank a couple of members uh, in my lab that were really involved in this project. Uh, Jean-Bastien Bott is a French postdoc from Strasbourg, a very gifted uh, postdoc, and Jennifer Robinson was also involved in the optogenetic work in that work. And <laughs> unfortunately, you can see him really well, Richard Boyce, who did all the REM uh, sleep studies. And I'll thank the different agencies and your attention. Thank you.